This is Scott Becker with the Becker Private Equity and Business Podcast. I'm thrilled today to get to visit with David Pivnik. David's a brilliant partner at McGuire Woods, who lives in sort of the healthcare private equity world, but in this at the intersection of where litigation meets sort of private equity and healthcare. So it represents people in big false claims cases, antitrust issues, all kinds of issues related to healthcare and litigation and counseling, including diligence. David let me ask you this question. Currently, in terms of the healthcare litigation world, is the Department of Justice active? What kinds of things are you seeing out there? What are funds and people thinking about as they do deals and, and look at sort of um, the Department of Justice and litigation and so forth? Yeah, so I think the, the short answer, and first, Scott, thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure. Um, I, I think the short answer is the Department of Justice is certainly active. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of cases that are being brought and a lot of investigations pursued by DOJ, both uh, in connection with uh, whistleblower key TAM complaints that have been filed where the DOJ is investigating, but also, frankly, uh, DOJ investigations that are being conducted sort of of its own accord, whether it's um, because of, of tips that have come in, monitoring of statistical data, which is you know continuing at, on the DOJ level uh, with a lot of rigor. So they're looking into statistical anomalies and deviations in investigating uh, or other hot button items, you know, opioids uh, and things related to the opi opioid epidemic continue to be hot. Uh, a lot of the activity I've seen over the last uh, 12 to 24 months has been in the lab space. Um, some of that is, is with pain management practices. Some of that is standalone uh, lab, lab cases, but I'm seeing a lot of activity in the lab uh, space in particular. But in, in general, I think across the country, the DOJ has been fairly active, is regularly pursuing and investigating fraud, particularly in the healthcare space. Uh, I think the one nuance that I have seen is uh, investigations have tended to move slower over the last couple of years uh, than I was seeing before that. And some of that might be a result of you know COVID and, and people being more remote than they previously were. Uh, some of it might be a manpower issue, but I think Generally speaking, a lot of activity and a lot of cases and investigations, uh, but those that I'm seeing are, are tending to move a little bit more slowly than they, they did in the prior years. Fantastic. It does seem like, like you're not hearing a lot about Department of Justice, OIG, investigations of hospitals and health systems. So what you're seeing on the antitrust side, in terms of the core litigation side, false claim side, are you seeing a lot of that or am I just not seeing it? I, I have not been, you know, I know one of our colleagues, uh, Holden Brooks, recently joined the firm and, and she sort of lives and breathes in the healthcare and I trust space and, and has indicated that activity is continuing to pick up and a lot of states are, are looking at rulemaking right now that I think will continue uh, to push that activity, but it, it's not something I've been seeing personally a lot, although it is driving a lot of discussions with clients, uh, particularly as they consider deals and targets. And then the other piece that sort of antitrust adjacent is the proposed rulemaking regarding non-competes that I think would, would put some real curbs potentially on the effectiveness of non-competes. And so we're still, uh, you know, waiting for the proposed rule to be finalized and to see what that looks like and what kind of time period will be in place for uh, adjusting existing agreements and things of that nature. But I think that could be one of the more uh, significant landmark shifts here is, is as uh, the FTC considers rulemaking on non-compete and enforceability going forward. Um, I think that could be a meaningful issue and something that sort of has some antitrust adjacent considerations. And, and do you think that this is likely to happen, this, um, this sort of the FTC DOJ position on non-compete? What, what are their expectations then, or is it just really, really hard to tell? I I I am I think it's hard to tell. I do think there's likely to be some rulemaking in place. I think what it looks like is probably still being shaped, and you know, both in terms of the parameters and and the timing of when it will be released and how long people have. I, I think is very much up in the air. But it, it's certainly a topic that I think is garnering a lot of scrutiny and and cap, capturing people's attention because it will have a significant impact on a lot of businesses. Um, and, and, you know, contractual obligations that they've been relying on in, in historic operations. I mean, fascinating, really. And does the FTC DOJ have the right to do this? Do they have authority or is that going to be challenged? 
I think they likely have the right, and I think it will likely be challenged. So whether there's arguments and, and that they could succeed on that is it's an overreach uh, remains to be seen, but I think there's likely at least a decent argument here. And uh, I think they've clearly looked into it and come to the conclusion that they have this authority, but uh, because it's going to have such a significant impact on so many industries and so many businesses, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, pushback that can be expected and uh, will be interesting to see how things play out as, as some of these issues get litigated, both in terms of potential challenges uh, on a more global level to any rule that comes out, but also, uh, you know, sort of on a micro level day to day with, with discrete restrictive covenants that might get challenged uh, between employers and empl employees, as well as the sort of adjusting of existing restrictive covenants to try and make them comply uh, with any rule that does come out. So I think there'll be a lot of activity on that front. I mean, just literally fascinating um, as you look at this um, it, it, to see what happens with that. Anything else you're following currently that you're particularly excited about or focused on or thinking about? That I'm, that I'm following, not necessarily, but I'm monitoring always DOJ activity and, and where they're focused. Um, and as I said earlier, seeing a lot of activity in, in um, connection with the opioid epidemic, a lot more focus on home health and hospice and uh, cases in that space, um, but more just generally monitoring and seeing where the DOJ is focused. Uh, it's also interesting to see sort of what types of allegations are coming up, I, I, you know, in, in terms of the theories that are being pursued under the False Claims Act. Uh, seeing a lot more cases coming out still where the underlying allegations relate to, you know, purported violations of the anti-kickback statute uh, and things of that nature as compared to sort of more black and white fraud in terms of upcoding or billing for services that are not rendered. So I'm seeing a lot of the implied certification types of cases coming up and, and think that will be a theme that continues, particularly as people are, you know, continually more aware of the False Claims Act and significant consequences and reasons why uh, you ought to avoid, you know, committing sort of open and obvious fraud, um, whereas it's a little bit trickier, you know, to avoid an implied certification case where the concept is any violation of law in theory could give rise if it's material, uh, you know, to FCA exposure. So still, still you need to comply with the law, but it creates a different spectrum uh, as compared to sort of deliberate or intentional, you know, fraud. David, again, thank you very much for joining the Becker Private Equity Business Podcast. Always a pleasure to visit you. Thank you very much for joining us back. Thanks for having me on, Scott.